let's start by considering a type of problem that you're very likely to encounter in a physics education that would benefit from the use of linear algebra. And that is a circuit like this one that's got lots of pieces going on, several resistors, several batteries. Uh, if you've taken a physics two course, hopefully you recognize this as a situation where you need to use Kirchhoff's laws. Kirchhoff's laws come in two varieties. There's the loop rule, and there's the junction rule. These are basically uh, circuit-based implementations of two conservation laws. Uh, the first conservation law, let me correctly spell the word rule here, there we go. The first rule, the loop rule, is basically conservation of energy because it says that by the time you go around a loop, you need to have kind of reset the voltages that are going on in the circuit. Let me show you what this means. So this circuit, for example, has two loops. There's a loop on the left. Maybe we'll call that L for the left loop. And there's a loop on the right. Maybe we'll call that R for the right loop. Doesn't really matter what you call it. But the idea is that if you go around and sum up all the voltage changes across all the circuit elements, that total needs to be zero by the time you come back around. Because otherwise, the circuit is building up more and more energy out of nowhere and is going to explode eventually. So you just pick a spot to start at. Let's suppose we start here and we have to pick a direction for the loop. So I tend to go uh, clockwise on these. Um, so the first thing we're going to meet is this R1. Uh, and so I need the amount of voltage that R1 gets. Well, let's, uh, let's call the current in this branch I sub 1. So I would be losing an amount of voltage equal to I1 times R1. Uh, you know what, we can go ahead and put numbers in too. Let's go ahead and put some numbers in. I1 times 0.5. And usually my students know I'm a pretty big stickler for units when it comes to circuits. There's not really a whole lot of extra units going around, right? As long as you're careful with the kilos and the picos and the micros, the units work out in the circuits problem. I, I usually don't worry about them too much here. When I come along uh, to this next piece, I see that I've got a change in voltage of 20 volts. So I'm going to gain 20 volts here. Then I hit R2 over here. That's going to be another voltage loss. So I'm going to have uh, I2, excuse me, I1 <clears throat> times uh, also a resistance of 0 0.5. Cool. Then I come to this spot, and I've got to keep going down this way. So for right now, I'm just going to ignore the fact that there's some additional current going here, except for the fact that now I need to have two more currents. I need to have an I2 going down the center and an I3 going along here. It really doesn't matter what you call these. I'm using the labels one, two, three, etc., because that's convenient. You could call them IA, IB, IC if you wanted to. Um, you're going to end up you know, using numbers or letters or some sort of subscript to keep track of them. So then we're going to keep going this way and we're going to have a minus I2 times another half of an ohm. And now if you notice for the battery here, we're going from positive negative, we're going the wrong way, quote unquote, in the battery. So that's gonna be a minus 20. And then I keep going and I've got another half an ohm. So that's gonna be minus I2 times half an ohm. Finally, I need to go through this part here. I'm back to I1. So this is gonna be minus an I1, right? And so that whole thing, needs to equal zero at the end of the day because I need to have all my currents, I need to have all my voltages uh, reset by the time I get back around to my starting dot over here. And you'll see that some things are going to cancel. We can simplify this and we certainly will, but I'm just worried about writing them down for right now. When I go to repeat the process in the loop on the right, uh, we can even label these L and R here. Uh, when I go to repeat this for loop R, uh, let's suppose we start over at this point. Uh, I come up to this R5 and what I notice is that I'm going in the opposite direction of the current. So my loop is going up this way, my current is coming down. So that means I'm actually going to gain a voltage there because I'm going the opposite direction. I actually have a, a step up in voltage. 
So I'll have a positive i to uh, 0 0.5. And I should uh, emphasize that you know we, we guess the direction of the currents. If we guess wrong, it'll have a minus sign. It'll tell us that we guessed wrong. The, the magnitude, the, 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 the actual number itself will still be the same. Then we step up with 20 volts in the battery in the center there, and then we have another plus I2 times a 0 0.5. Uh, then we're gonna continue along the second part of that loop, where we're finally gonna get an I3 over here, and so I'll have a minus uh, I3 times three, so three I3. We're now going to lose six volts because we're going from the positive to the negative, and the next part we're going to lose uh, what's that going to be? One times I3. And then I'm back around to where I started. So that whole thing needs to equal zero. Again, we can combine some of those things because there's multiple I2s, multiple I3s. We'll combine them in a second. I'm just worried about getting the, the actual information down first. Uh, then we need to do the junction rule. The idea of the junction rule is that this is conservation of charge. Right, that you can't just have charge appearing out of nowhere, meaning you can't have current appearing out of nowhere. So for this rule, if we look at this junction that they've already labeled B for us, this means that I1, when it splits apart into I2 and I3, I2 has to equal, excuse me, I1 has to equal I2 plus I3. So those three equations are enough for me to uh, be able to figure out what is going on in the circuit. Because ultimately I have three unknowns, I1, I2, and I3. And so I can adjust these equations a little bit. For example, equation L, I can combine all of the I1s. So let's circle everybody who's got an I1. So I've got an I1 there, got an I1 there. I have another I1 here. So ultimately I'm gonna have a negative two I1 because I've got minus a half, minus a half, minus one is all minus two. Uh, let's next count all the I2s. So I've got a minus a half times I2 here, another minus a half I2 here. So that comes to a nice, neat negative I2. Now with the others, there's some constants in there. I'm gonna treat those a little bit differently. I'm gonna move those to the other side. So I'm gonna collect them and then make them negative because I want those to go, I want my constants to go on the far side of the equation. And I'll have a plus 20 minus 20. I spoke too soon. I don't need a negative sign at all because that all equals zero. All right, that's all that L equation is, is putting together those factors, et cetera, to get me this relationship between I1 and I2. Now let's do the same thing with R. We're gonna clean this up a little bit. Uh, again, let's start with the I1s. Uh, oh, I don't have any I1s, so let's start with, uh, okay, I wanna keep my colors consistent here. Uh, let's go with blue to circle the I2s, so I'll have plus a half, plus a half gives me nothing, so that's gonna be an I2 here. Uh, let's see, I am actually out of colors here, so let's, I guess I'll repeat the green, fine. Oh, you know what, I haven't used black. There we go, we'll use black for the I3s. So I have a minus three I3 minus an I3 is gonna be minus four I3. And now let's gather together our constants. I better have some constants on this one or else all of our I's are gonna be zero, right? Um, let's see, I have a plus 20 minus six gives me a 14, but I wanna move that to the other side to be a negative 14. And then the last bit, uh, the junction here, I guess I better color code everybody if I started this color coding, is gonna be I1. And now again, for this to become a linear algebra problem, I wanna put all of the unknown variables on one side and then I wanna put all the known constants on the other side. So let's have I1 minus an I2 minus an I3 equals zero. So that is the mathematical setup for this problem. And what you would probably typically do if you're a student in physics two would be to just start solving, would be to pick the thing that looks the easiest to solve for and start doing some substitutions. I might pick I2 uh, in the R equation because that's gonna be pretty easy to solve for I2 and then plug that into the others, solve for I3, plug that into, into, the, into L, and then you know kind of proceed from there. But 
what I hope you remember from that process is that it's it's nice. It is sure, it is surefire way to get through. It's a bit messy though. It can take you a few pages to do that. Surely there is a way we can get a computer to do this process for us. Because here's the thing, going through the page and a half of that algebra really does not teach you any physics, right? I, I like to say at this point in my classes that the physics is over. It's an algebra problem now. And to be quite frank as a physics educator, I don't really care how much algebra my students learn. I want them to think through the physics, not wrangle through the algebra and miss points on the algebra when they understand the physics perfectly well. So the way we would transform this into a linear algebra problem would be to notice a few things. First, I notice that there's no uh, I3 on that first equation, but I could add one in, right? I could have over here a plus zero I3 all equals uh, zero. Same thing on this second equation. There's no I1 listed, but I could certainly create one. I think what I'll, I think what I'll do with this one is just copy the equation down here. I2 minus uh, four I3 equals negative 14. Because what I want to do is have each of these written kind of the same way, where there's an I1, an I2, and an I3, even if one of those happens to be zero. So what I'm gonna do is grab my green here and have a zero I1. Now let's grab our blue to have a minus four uh, I, excuse me, minus I2. There we go, there's my I2. And then we'll have in black a minus four I3. And all of that equals negative 14. Okay, I don't need my reference equation down here anymore, perfect. But what I hope you recognize from this is that each of these equations, they're all structured the same way. I've got some number times I1 plus some number times I2 plus some number times I3. And yes, some of those numbers are zero, but zero is, is still a number, right? I still have the same structure. So, and the important thing is that this is all linear, right? That's why we put the linear in linear algebra because there's no squares, there's no exponents, there's no sines and cosines, there's no functions in here. It's all just linear combinations of I I1, I2, and I3. And in fact, in no Kirchhoff's Law problem will you end up with any weird functions. It's always going to be linear because Ohm's Law, V equals IR, is linear, right? There, there's no powers involved in there. This is all just solving linear equations. That's exactly why we developed linear algebra. It's because I can take these coefficients, I can take the negative two, the zero, and the one, right? There's a one in front of there. And I can take the I2s, I can take the negative one, negative one, negative one. And I can take the I3 coefficients, the zero, negative four, and one. Future Brian here, I forgot to copy down the negative sign here. There should be a negative on this one. I will catch that in the next episode, don't worry. And what I can do, I can call those a matrix. Because the thing is, I1, I2, I3, those are my variables, those are my unknown things. I don't, I don't really need a special name for those, right? I could call those X, Y, Z. I could call them I, A, I, B, I, C. I could call them anything I wanted to. The thing that's gonna differ from one circuit problem to the next is what those coefficients are, right? Because those coefficients come from the resistance values. And so when I trade out resistors in my circuit, what I'm doing is changing the numbers that are in this matrix. Now to finish out the rest of the equation, I can write a couple other things. I can write my I1, I2, I3 as a vector. Right, I can write this as what's called a column vector, where I have an I1 and I have an I2 and I have an I3. I'm gonna stop my color coding after this. It's a little more trouble than it's worth, I think. And then I can have this equal to all my other numbers, my constants, my zero, negative 14, zero. Because what this does, this is a way of codifying all the math that's in equations L, R, and B. This matrix up here, this matrix equation, contains all the same information as those three equations L, R, and B. What I mean by that is that if I take these things and I do the matrix multiplication, I'm gonna get back 
L, R, and B. Let me show you how that works. What I do in order to carry out the matrix math is take each row here and multiply it by this column. What that means is I take, for example, the negative two and I multiply that by I1. So I take negative two times I1. Then I take the second element and multiply it by the second element. So that's gonna be a minus one times I2. And then I take the third element, multiply by the third element. That's gonna be plus zero I3. All equals this top element here gonna equal zero. Well, that's exactly what I have in equation L. It's the exact same thing. Uh, if I want to do the second equation, I take my second row here, multiply it by my one column here. That's gonna give me a negative 14. And so I'll have a zero I1 minus one I2 minus four I3. What I do is I take this piece, multiply it by this piece, take this piece, multiply it by this piece, and take this piece, multiply it by this piece. And then I take those three products and add them together. It's just like doing a dot product. You have X component times X component plus Y component times Y component plus Z component times Z component. All needs to equal the center thing over here, negative 14. And then you can repeat the process for that second, for the, excuse me, for that third row. You're gonna get the same information there in the, uh, in the second and third equations, just like we have up there. And you say, okay, what is the point of this? Why would I even care? It's just, you're just taking the problem and you're recasting it. The reason we care about this, the reason this is useful to us is because now what I can do is take all the tools that are available to me in linear algebra and take them and apply them to this problem. So for example, what I would do at this point to turn this into a linear algebra problem, I would give these things names. So I would call this matrix, usually you use a capital letter for a matrix, it's just the convention, I would call this thing A. And then I would take this thing and I would call it this column vector and I would call it by a vector name. Maybe it's, a, it's given by I, so let's maybe call it the I vector, you know. And then I would take this piece here, this is the Outputs, that's where I get my voltages. So maybe that's a, maybe that's a voltage, a, a vector of voltages, if you will. Voltage is not really a vector, but I've got an array of voltage values. So let's just roll with it. Uh, so what I end up with is an equation, right? I can take this messy thing. I can write this as an equation where A times this vector equals another vector, right? And the thing is, I want to solve for I. Right, because I know all the elements of A, I know all the elements of V, I is my unknown. Well, I is being stuck there, being is stuck there being multiplied by a matrix. How do I get rid of that? How do I free I from the matrix multiplication? And the sort of straightforward answer is, well, I need to move A to the other side, right? And so what we do, we multiply both sides by A's inverse. I need a matrix that will cancel A. I need a matrix, so when I take A inverse times A, I end up with one. I end up with a matrix that's just going to multiply the whole thing by one, that's gonna leave the thing unchanged. What I need is for I to equal A inverse of V. And so what we do in linear algebra, we are very interested in figuring out how do I get this inverse, because as soon as I have that inverse, I will be able to uh, I will be able to apply it to this v vector and get my i vector, and that's what we're going to take a look at how to do using some tools in Python.